So please give a warm welcome to our next speaker, Matt Hollis. Come on up. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Matt Hollis. The purpose of my talk tonight is to present uh, a couple different wineries and to show how how's it going? How the uh, the age old the age old tradition of winemaking um, has recently been infused with more and more and more and more complex technology. And as a sideline, I wanted to show um, some. Uh, I intriguing parallels of how wineries are growing closer and closer to um, villains' lairs in James <laughs> Bond movies. <laughs> so, to complete the analogy, I'm going to play the role of James Bond. My name is Matt Hollis, and I'm an architect that specializes in wineries. Um, I am a principal of an uh, of a architecture firm here in San Francisco, and um, let's see, what else do they want to say? Um, well, I, I guess the, the main thing that I wanted to say is that um, I am an architect. I, I design buildings. I've never taken a class in viticulture or enology, and I'm, I'm a generalist in that I'm familiar with a lot of different subjects uh, and very complex technology, but I'm a master of none. I work with incredibly talented engineers and winemakers from whom I learn a great deal. So um, again, I guess I'm disqualified as a nerd, but whatever. <laughs> um, I, about 10 years ago, I worked for a company called Taylor Lombardo Architects. Uh, and I, uh, one of the people that I worked there with was Bart's wife, Beth Bernhardt, who I believe is here tonight. <laughs> Hi, Beth. And uh, Beth is a very talented project manager who uh, I really enjoyed working with. And she and I worked on a number of the facilities that you see here. Um, Silver Oak Cellars, Nickel and Nickel, Freestone Winery, Pay Winery. And um, we got exposed to the fundamentals, fundamental components that make up a winery. Um, here are some wineries that uh, I've worked on on my own. I started my own office about five or six years ago. And, you know, some of the facilities are big, some are small. Uh, sometimes I'm a consultant to other architects. And sometimes I'm the guy that people go to to design the entire campus, soup to nuts. And then sometimes it's just like a hospitality area, like in the upper left-hand corner, that's Etude winery tasting room in Carneros, and other times it's a production area. Here's uh, Vengi Vineyards, and it's all about the um, barrel storage room. And the client for Peshmeral Winery is here tonight, so there's Peshmeral Winery, all right. <laughs> so, now is the point in a James Bond movie where the groundwork is laid where you, you can sort of see the diabolical villains, in this case, winemakers, uh, sort of <laughs> discussing like what kind of fiendish plot they have for taking over the world. So um, to give you a little bit of background about winemaking and just the wine industry, I want to ask a question. And I'm hoping for a little bit of audience participation here. Who can guess what percentage of wine is made in Napa Valley from all of California production. Five percent. Okay, careful because if you're wrong, you're going to end up like this guy. Forty. The answer is five percent. Yeah, and the reason, but for those of you who don't know, the red little patch up there, that's Napa Valley. The blue is Sonoma. The yellow is Mendocino County, and then this big swath is San Joaquin Valley. That's where like, you know, 75% of the strawberries in the world are grown. And that's where uh, Gallo, um, one of the largest, uh, the largest winery in the world, um, they make, just that winery alone makes 750 million cases of wine per year. 
still family owned. Kind of amazing. So here's, um, here's a map of uh, sort of Napa and Sonoma combined. And you can see all the red dots represent uh, different wineries that I've worked on over the years. Uh, most of them are in Napa Valley. I guess I should be using the pointer. Sorry about that. Most of them are in Napa Valley. Uh, we've got one up here in um, Cloverdale, one out here in um, Freestone. So uh, I'm going to sort of jump around a little bit here. We're going to go from California to some different places around the world. Um, grape juice comes from grapes, and grapes are grown on vineyards. And um, vineyards typically just, it's kind of weird, they're always in like the most beautiful places in the world. Uh, in the upper left, uh, we've got uh, Lake Balaton, Hungary. Uh, it's the largest lake in Europe. It's really great. I was there last year. This is uh, Mendoza. Uh, Argentina, looking due west at the Andes. This is uh, Peliasac Island in Croatia, looking out over the Adriatic. And then this is Napa Valley, uh, from an airplane. <laughs> what, you guys don't think it's beautiful? <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. Um, this is looking out towards San Francisco. And one of the points I wanted to make with this slide is that you've got this um, concept called terroir, and that's the last French word I'll be saying this evening. Um, <laughs> it basically translates roughly as a sense of place. And so, you know, why does this grape better than this grape? You know, it's, well, you know, it's grown on a certain slope, and that slope happens to be facing in a certain direction. It gets this, this much sun, and the soil is like this, and, you know, it, it actually happens even within Napa Valley. Here's the Mayakama Mountains, which are nice and lush and green. And on this side, the Yolo Mountains are much more dry. And you've got oak trees and lots of rocks and sandy soil. It makes a big difference. So not to like get too into it, but like winemaking has been around for over 10,000 years. And only in the last, you know, couple hundred has, you know, like since the Industrial Revolution, has um, technology started to really get into it. And um, you can see with uh, basically the advent of um, stainless steel and the electric engine, like the uh, assembly line production has, has really uh, entered into it. And I'm going to show you a couple uh, winemaking machines that I think are absolutely crucial to the experience. Uh, the first is the crusher destemmer. And what happens is grapes are dumped into one end. And here's a really cool shot of the interior. And it's got this uh, groovy cylindrical tube that is perforated. And not coincidentally, the perforations are about the size of grapes. So the thing starts spinning, and whole clusters of grapes go in, and through centrifugal force, the grapes are thrust out to the, uh, against the exterior walls of the cylinder, and the grapes go through the holes, but the stems do not. So hence the name destemmer. Um, the stems all go out in the end. Yeah. That's one of my clients. I guess. <laughs> So uh, I'm not going to get too into it because wine is made a million different ways, uh, but I'll make a really gross generalization and say that these are some of the fu fundamental components. Over here you've got 1,300-pound uh, capacity macro bins where grapes are picked in the field, dumped in there, they're put on the top of a flat, flatbed truck. Just a second. And um, they're stored for not a very long time, short time, in um, adjacent to the assembly line. The assembly at the assembly line, um, the the horizontal conveyance, um, uh, cellar workers take out bad bunches of grapes, um, small animals, rocks, and stones. <laughs> The grapes then cruise up the, the vertical conveyor and are dumped into my favorite machine, the crusher destemmer. And here you can see a macro bin is set up and you've got all these stems 
piling out. And then underneath, you've got this, this uh, just sort of slurry of grape juice and skins that are about the same consistency as jam. And it's called must. So the next item on the assembly line is uh, what I would say the crucial winemaking machine number two. And this is the fermenter. And this is where it all goes down. Um, wine or grape juice is converted to wine in these guys. Um, fermenters come in many different shapes and sizes. This is basically what you're going to see most often in Napa um, in small boutique wineries. They're about six feet wide, six feet tall. Um, this is the 750 million case per year facility that I was talking about with Gallo. These are obviously outside. Uh, each one of these tanks holds about 100,000 gallons of wine. Each one of these holds about uh, 1,500 gallons of wine. That's 7,500 7, bottles. Um, most of the time, wine, uh, fermentation rooms are just about production and just, just making the wine. But other times, here at Nickel and Nickel, another Taylor Lombardo project, we've got, um, you know, they make it look really nice so you can, like, have a... Uh, a dinner or a wedding there or some kind of other fun activity. <laughs> um, so this is the point in the movie where Q says, no, pay attention, 007, because <laughs> I'm going to get a little bit technical. Well, not no, you know what, I'm not going to. Um, this is, this is the fer as I said, this is a fermentation tank. And these guys run uh, between $5,000 and $50,000. Um, why are they so expensive? One of the reasons is because on the exterior they've got um, this really cool double ja double layer cooling jacket, and it's it's quilted. It's got this grid uh, point grid um, that's soldered by lasers, and um, the the reason it has it is so that um, this refrigerant uh, glycol can cruise around the outside of the jacket, um, outside of the tank and control the temperature of what's going on in the inside. Uh, these guys are um, pipes that are basically welded to the exterior that allow for wine on the very bottom to be pumped over to the top. One of the things that happens with wine um, when it's being fermented, it's sort of like leaving orange juice, like really pulpy orange juice in the glass out of the refrigerator out overnight. Like all the pulp rises to the top and it sort of forms a cap. So you don't want it, you, naturally you don't want that to happen. You want it to sort of stay mixed. So you're constantly pumping over. So here's a close up of the jacket that I was talking about. And naturally when you've got a vertical cylinder of a fluid, um, due to the way that temperature works, you've got uh, the warmer fluid is rising and the colder fluid is staying on the bottom. So a lot of times these jackets are separated and there's several, um, I guess, stripes that are happening. And so you've got different temperatures of glycol that are flowing through. And so that way a winemaker can have very specific control of the temperature. Um, usually a jacket, a, a, a fermentation tank only has two different stripes going across. I've seen them with as many as five. And that's kind of ridiculous, but you know that's what you're paying for. Um, so w when you look inside a fermentation tank, this is what you see. Um, this is the must that I was talking about earlier. And if you notice here, it's kind of foaming. And the word fermentation literally means to boil. And so what's happening um, is gly uh, glucose or sugar is being converted to um, Carbon dioxide, heat, and alcohol. There you go. Good job. Um, and so the carbon dioxide is boiling up here and doing its thing. And so the residual heat needs to be controlled. Otherwise, it's going to damage the fermentation process. So, um, of course, yeast is helping out in this endeavor. It's sort of the catalyst in this whole process. And diff yeast comes from, um, there's this sort of uh, ambient yeast that's going to be around, it, it's actually on the surface of grapes 
like when they pick them. They're, it's just naturally occurring. Um, but that yeast, that, that natural yeast is sort of unpredictable. And when you're talking about, you know, a multi-million dollar operation annually and all the rest of it, you don't, you, you want to uh, minimize your margin of risk. So you rely on cultured, uh, cultured yeast, i.e. from a factory. And, um, you know, um, if you're looking for organic wine and all that sort of thing, you're not going to find it um, with cultured yeast. Um, so then the next crucial machine, uh, and this is the third and final crucial machine, is the press. Um, most wineries have a pneumatic press. Oops, sorry. This guy here. And inside it's got a huge uh, bladder um, that uh, enlarges and it squeezes the must after it's gone through the fermentation tank and it comes out the bottom. And then this guy is something that you'll see at a lot of boutique wineries. It's a, it's a um, basket press. And it's sort of a return to the traditional basket press. Um, it, uh, if you've ever seen, you know what a uh, wooden basket press looks like. And, um, you know, some people think it's kind of funny that they're doing this, but it actually gives greater control and um, uh, control of the exposure of tannins to the grape juice, which uh, totally affects the flavor. So then what happens, is, of course, is the wine is transferred into barrels where the proteins in the wine are further broken down and the tannins are mellowed with the walls of the uh, oak barrels and um, it ages for, you know, usually like two years before they put it into bottles. So you'll probably notice here that, well, that's weird. How come sometimes they're stacked really high and then sometimes they're, they're uh, they're just uh, one layer high. And again, the answer comes down to temperature. Um, if you're a fancy winery and you can afford the real estate to have a, a really nice uh, barrel storage room that's got this great ambiance and it's been designed by a really cool architect and all the rest of it, um, then, you know, go for it. You know, you're going to have tours in here and all the rest of it. Um, and, of course, the temperature at this one level is going to be the same. But if you're just like, you know, let's just store it in this warehouse here, and I don't care if the temperature up here is different than the temperature down here, just go for it. You know, that's what people do. But, you know, I, I don't want to trash all the wineries that do tight packing with their barrels, because um, a lot of my clients do that. And <laughs> um, it still works fine, and their wine is really good. Um, <laughs> This, I, I just thought this is interesting. Of course, all the facilities that I work on in the United States, we have to be, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an alcoholic beverage. It's just like, you know, uh, it's a factory. And so we, everything has to be really hygienic and really clean. And I went to Hungary last year, and here's a barrel storage room. You see the furry stuff on each brick? That's, that's mold. That's, that's where the term ambient yeast comes in. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... Is that a kid drinking wine? No, no. The... <laughs> somebody, it's somebody that acted like a kid, but... <laughs> so, um, one of the last steps, of course, is bottling. And um, usually bottling is done with a mobile bottling truck. These guys cost about $100,000. So it's um, pretty capital intensive and only like a really fancy big winery is going to actually own one. This next slide is for Prudence Ferrara, who I know is here, um, one of my client's daughters. Um, this is about processed wastewater. Uh, processed wastewater is, uh, it sounds like a really boring thing, but it's actually really important in my job. When you clean out a tank, you know, there's going to be a little bit of residual wine that's coming out of it. And, you know, you can't just dump it into a creek. It's got a um, very acidic pH level. It's got something called biochemical oxyg oxygen demand level that's like, um, it affects it's all the microorganisms that are going to be in the water, and it's got a very high suspended solid level. So you've got to treat it somehow before you dump it in the creek, or dump it in the soil or do whatever to it. And one way is with, 
um, process wastewater aeration ponds, where I know you're looking at this and saying, wow, those are really beautiful fountains. But those are actually aerating the water and trying to get it to be exposed to um, well, oxygen, obviously, and there's a bunch of bacteria that's eating it. And then this is something that's called a bioreactor, and it's basically a black box proprietary technology, and they infuse it with oxygen and hit it with caustic soda so that the pH level goes from acidic to basic and um, all that cool stuff. So this is a winery that is under construction right now. It's called Joseph Cellars, and it's up in Napa. And I chose it as sort of a case study because it's got all the fundamental components. And one of the, reason, one of the things I really like about this facility is that, or this slide, this site plan, is that it sort of illustrates just how woven into the landscape, the surrounding landscape, a winery actually is. The building is just this guy right here. That's, this is a rendering of we had to do for the, um, the planning department. Uh, here's your, your vineyards. By the way, it's a 27-acre site. Half of it is flat. The other half is hillside. So that's what you're looking at back there. And so the idea was stuff the building against the base of the hill, and then these guys are caves. And so you've got a water source. Um, your processed wastewater gets dumped into leach lines over here. And um, you've got your, your crush area over here and your well over here. All good stuff. So here's the fundamental components and you've got about, let's see, I have to refresh my memory, about 1,500 barrels. This is an eight, uh, what is it? Um, 8,000 case a year facility, uh, Cabernet, Sauvignon, and uh, Chardonnay. Uh, we've got 27 fermentation tanks. Here's your, uh, your press, here's your uh, crusher, destemmer, which I like so much. And um, of course, all of these um, fermentation tanks require their, you know, their glycol, which I talked so much about earlier. Um, glycol is a refrigerant, much like Freon, but it's broke, uh, chemically it's different in that it's able to operate on such a huge industrial scale. And so here's where uh, the mechanical, uh, you've got like a chiller, condenser, and all that good stuff. That's all um, the pipes. Uh, then connect to the glycol jackets that are going on over here. So, firm it, so I'm going to say some basic stuff here, but it, it's, it's got a reason. Please note, nothing moves. Our fer fermentation tanks are all bolted to the floor. So, basic winery. You go up to Napa, you'll see a lot of these. And um, then here's, here's basically how it, how it all comes together. We've got a... Um, Everything is housed in a 12,000 square foot cave, uh, which at this point is already dug, and uh, they just began construction on an 8,000 square foot building. Should be done oh, sometime next year. Um, they're feverishly trying to make it all happen. So um, I really like caves. I think caves are really cool. And um, so this is sort of cave porn. Um, <laughs> Caves are dug, and I don't want you to take the analogy too far, but caves are dug with something called a road header. <laughs> I guess I set myself up for that one. You know what? Next slide. <laughs> All right. I prefer Sean Connery myself, but, you know. <laughs> um, this is John Shook. He's a really cool cave digger. Um, there's an episode of America's Dirtiest Jobs, which is dedicated to this guy. He's a great guy. And um, he hooked me up with a client, so I have to like, give him a referral. Um, this machine belongs to him, so that's just how cool he is. <laughs> so here we are with James Bond villains' lairs. And, um, I, I just want to make a little connection between, um, I, I've just sort of schooled you on the fundamentals of wineries, and now I'm, we're looking at um, some basic villains' lairs. Um, they're always, you know, they're interesting. Most of the time, they're subterranean, 
And they're, uh, they've got fantastic architecture. As a designer, I, I just love them. I think they're so cool. And they're always uh, located in some exotic place in the world. And the other interesting thing is there's something of a moon base. Like a winery, they're, they're designed so that, you know, if the whole world crashes around them, they can, conti they can uh, continue to do whatever they're doing inside. They've got generators. They've got their own water source. I'm sure they've got a great pre uh, processed wastewater system. Okay, so now I'm going to show you uh, a series of wineries uh, that are going to get uh, progressively more and more complex in technology. This is Cuvée San Winery, located in the Carneros region of Napa. Um, this is a Till Lombardo project. Um, on the, in, in the foreground here, these are co uh, open top fermentation tanks. At the moment, they've got like just a little uh, cover on it, like, sort of like a pool cover, just to make sure they don't get dirty inside. Uh, and then beyond, you've got um, closed-top Chardonnay tanks. Um, the reason that these guys are open-top is because they're for Pinot Noir. The next time you drink Pinot, um, hold it up to the light and look at it, because you'll notice that the color of Pinot is not quite as deep and red as, uh, say, a nice, robust Cabernet Sauvignon. It's because the grape is much more fickle. And in order to ferment it, you really have to masticate it. You know, like, think again of my analogy with the orange juice. You really have to take a straw and just like, you know, just plunge in there and really make it happen. So how do they do that with a winery? Well, they've got something called a punch down system. And this guy is, uh, it's on a rail that's bridging across, basically it's an overhead gantry. And then you've got these two rails that are going across here. So it can cruise across and basically hit any of these tanks that it wants to. Um, this is winemaker Steve Rogstad at Cuvée San. And here he is demonstrating the hydraulic piston that's associated with the punch down. And this is a bad guy from um, Moonraker. Um, anyway. Uh, Steve Rogstadt was really smart, and he still is really smart. And he, he said, um, you know, uh, here's, here's the plan for the winery. It's 100 feet wide and about uh, 250 feet long. And this whole area here is your fermentation room, and these are barrel storage rooms. And he was like, well, it doesn't make sense that we're dedicating half the building to fermentation if fermentation only takes six weeks out of the year. Uh, so. Uh, you do the math. There's a bunch of weeks that are left over where nothing's happening in that room, and it's, it's, not, um, it's not an efficient use of space. So what if, instead of the traditional way of having the fermentation tanks bolted to the floor, we have them mobile, and we can move them around? And not only that, what if the catwalks that service the fermentation tanks moved also, and we put them on these cool little casters? You know, I was blown away. I was just like, this is so cool. What a great client. But Steve, what about the glycol connections? I know you were, you were beating me. You were wondering about this also. <laughs> how, do we, how do we get the hot and cold glycol to these fermentation tanks? And you're also saying, wow, what a loser winery. They only have one jacket. It's not like striated multiple times. Anyway, don't be a snob. Um, so after multiple meetings with our plumbing... Um, consultant and our, our plumbing engineer and our plumbing so subcontractors. We came up with this really groovy detail that uh, had a, something called a quick disconnect that um, basically attached to something called a pigtail. And uh, so the pigtail was hanging from the glycol jacket, and then you've got these um, these. Uh, sections. There's, uh, I don't know, six or eight sections of catwalk that gang together like shopping carts. And you can see they've got the infrastructure, the, the hard pipe for the glycol and the rest of the plumbing underneath them. And anyway, that was pretty cool. So then came along Freestone Winery. And this is another Taylor Lombardo project. And um, the client here uh, said, I saw what you did at Cuvée San. I love it. But you know what? Cuvée San is a flat site, and um, flat sites require pumping. And 
I believe that pumping bruises the, the wine. So I don't want anything about pumping. I'm going to do what you did, but I want to do it on a hillside. And of course, uh, if you look, if you travel to Europe and you go visit a bunch of wineries, there, um, wineries are traditionally on hillsides because they, that's before they had pumps. That's how they got the wine to go from um, stage to stage. So we thought, oh, that's great. That's so cool. So here's a plan, and you know, it's basically the same plan as you have over at Cuvée Song. But the section does this, where up here is the crush area where we have the crusher de-stemmer, and it's, it's covered, but it's outside. And then the must gets dumped into, it gets directly dumped into the fermentation tanks. Uh, again, this is a uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay facility. So we've got these fermentation tanks that get pulled directly over to this, um, the edge of this sort of cliff. And then they get taken to their place and the punch down cruises along and does its thing. And then of course barrel storage is uh, below that. Um, the other groovy thing that I like to point out about this slide is that um, you can see that the profile of the building was completely determined by the winemaking activity that happened within it. Um, and that was very difficult to do because, you know, like when you're sweating about clearances and all that sort of thing, you just don't want to make a mistake. So, I told you that we were getting progressively more and more complex, and here we are. This is the Paul Maas Winery, and this is located um, on Mount George uh, in Napa. It's on the eastern side, uh, not too far from the town of Napa proper. And uh, it was designed by John Lale, a very talented architect. I had nothing to do with this facility. Um, this facility is 100,000 square feet and it makes 8,000 cases of wine, which is about half as much as any of the other facilities that I showed you. This is a 72 foot wide, 54 foot high, subterranean parabolic dome. It is the biggest engineered parabolic dome in the world. Um, it's really amazing. So why am I so fixated on this facility? Um, it's because now, uh, you know, I've, I've been talking about like all these moving tanks and all these moving parts. At this facility, at the previous facilities that I was talking about, the tanks moved around by a uh, forklift. You get a forklift underneath it and you move it from place to place. Here, the tanks are on a rotating carousel. <laughs> The, um, you, you've got your horizontal conveyance and everything is, is dumping into your crusher destemmer, which is located on a cantilevered platform. And then that dumps it into um, the, the carousel. The tanks just sort of cruise around, dumps it in there. And then after uh, four to six weeks of fermentation, it gets dumped into another cantilevered platform where the press is. And then after that, the wine flows into these settling tanks, all by gravity. And then eventually, here's, here's the parabolic cave that I was talking about. And look at all of these. These are pinwheel configured caves. This really exists. <laughs> anyway. So, back to James Bond. So, anyway, to complete the analogy, um, you know, wineries have hospitality areas, which are not unlike, you know, in every James Bond movie, you know, he breaks into the, the bad guy's lair and he gets caught and he gets knocked out and he wakes up in a room like this and then he, uh, then somebody tells him that he's been invited to dinner with Dr. No and here he is drinking wine and Dr. No very uh, calmly and coolly tells him about his plans um, to take over the world using technology and the, the, the coolness and the calmness is, you know, it's not unlike somebody that's standing across from a tasting room counter describing just how great the wine is at that facility. So, uh, that was me. So, where do we go from here? Could it get any more complex or are we just gonna just stop? Um, I think that the next frontier is urban wineries. 
Um, about five years ago, I took a tour of an urban winery called York Creek uh, with Fritz Maytag, the owner of um, Anchor Steam Brewery. And uh, York Creek is right across the street. And at that time, he was the only bonded winery in San Francisco. Uh, at this point, you can see that we're pushing double digits. And we've got some in Alameda and on Treasure Island. But why have a winery in San Francisco, or in any urban area for that matter? And the reason is that you know, it comes down to a couple things. First of all, there's um, the process wastewater question. You know, it's really difficult to deal with that huge volume of water. You have to make you know, a gigantic aeration pond, which you know, covers several acres, or else you could just dump it into the city sewer. <laughs> and um, the, the Department of Public Works is actually into that because the pH level of uh, processed waste is very acidic and the pH level of sewage is very alkaline. I'm not an expert in effluent chemistry, but you know, I'm told that it all works out very well. So um, anyway, very exciting. Uh, anyway, I'd like to dedicate this talk to my dad. Um, he uh, introduced me to wine and James Bond and architecture. Um, <laughs> not necessarily in that order. Um, I'd also like to uh, just do a final plug for my office. Uh, and also, thank you very much, Jamie Pratt, for uh, putting together, the, my intern, for putting this all together. Um, <laughs> And my girlfriend, Hilda, for listening to me rehearse. Um, but uh, we are an office that does a lot of wineries, but we don't only do wineries. Um, right now, we're doing a, uh, a bowling alley in the Mission District. Yeah. We do a lot of houses and uh, offices, and um, I'll be giving out business cards later this evening, so if you know of anybody. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Five minutes of questions. Any questions? Go. <laughs> the question is, how is space how is space being maximized at, in urban wineries to make it more efficient? Because there's not enough room. You're exactly right. Um, well, I have to say that when you have a space, you use it. You know, when you're on a farm out in Napa Valley or wherever, you tend to spread out a lot more. And when you're in um, a, a warehouse condition, such as, you know, the South of Market or Potrero Hill or the Mission or wherever, uh, it's not as pretty. And you tend to do uh, tight stack, um, tight pack barrels and, um, y you know, you just work around it. You just stuff it all together. So. Um, you know, I, it's great. <laughs> I, I've only been to a couple tastings for uh, urban wineries, and you know, I, I think that they're growing. I think it's a new thing, so. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say this Q&A is only going to last for a couple minutes. I know you are also fascinated by the crazy cool stuff you just learned, but let's give the conversation a pause for just a couple more minutes. Thank you. Right here. Um, what have you learned from building wineries at, that you can apply to like bowling alleys or houses? <laughs> wow, tough crowd tonight. <laughs> what have you learned from building wineries that you could apply to bowling alleys and houses? <laughs> or offices? Well, you know, it's, it's all about schedule and budget, you know, and, and, and it, it's also all about, you know, Every, every situation is different. Every winery is different. 
and you know you 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 look at each situation and you try to keep come up with a beautiful solution. Um, a lot of times, you know, somebody told me once, uh, architecture is making the best out of a shitty situation. You know, you, you, you're, you're, it's never perfect. You know, you, you've, you've got to jam things in here, just like, you know, with the example that you're giving, you know, it, it's always hard. And, um, and then on top of that, people want you to make it beautiful. So it's, you, you, you just have to be light on your feet and um, just make it happen. So I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> right there. That place at the dome. Uh, Palm Oz. Yes. How many jackets do they have? <laughs> they have five. Uh, he was asking me how many, how many striations of jackets, of uh, glycol cooling jackets, are on their fermentation tanks. They have five. How's their wine? Their wine is very good. Uh, it, 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 it is very good. I was there. They only make one wine, Cabernet Sauvignon. And, you know, I recommend going there for a tour. And if you go there for a tour, if you're at all like a car buff, uh, the guy owns the largest collection, private collection of Porsches. And you, you have to ask to see it because they don't ordinarily show it. Right over there. Favorite winery that I've done. Um, you know, they're all special for different reasons, uh, and I know that's a lame answer. They're not your kids. Are you right? Well, <laughs> you know, sometimes the client is really cool, and, and it's just a, a really great experience. Like, you, you really feel like, you know, you're getting down and dirty with the winemaker, and they're stoked to work with you. There's some rich guy that's paying me to design a building for them, and they appreciate, like, what a magical moment this is, and and ideas are flowing and you know if you came along and saw the building you'd probably say eh. but you know something really great happened and so I love it for that reason other times it's a it's an aesthetic exercise and you know we're just like I'm really happy with Etude that's the one I showed earlier that has all these bottles on on the wall um, that's just a, a hospitality situation but the client was like yeah we want it to be bold we want it to be modern and you know I, I got to you know live out some design fantasies on that one. So, you know, everyone is, you know, there's a couple that, you know, it was just a, a rotten situation from the beginning, and so I didn't like those. But, you know, the, most of them turned out pretty good. Yes? One more, and let's see if there's someone from the balcony. What, oh, the woman that's arms, flailing arms. All right, what is the most ghetto rigged, clues together, improvised, winemaking situation that you've ever seen? Uh, well, okay, I'll, actually that's pretty easy. Um, this is so nasty. I, uh, one time uh, somebody approached me and asked me to be an expert witness. It was a, a lawyer asked me to be an expert witness on a, um, because I've worked on so many wineries, uh, there was a warehouse and um, sort of like the, some of the photos that I showed you where it was tight packed and um, you know, in these metal buildings, you have to, you, you have insulation on the roof because otherwise the sun just pounds down and it's just hotter than all get out inside. And so the insulation was this sort of pillowy, um, it's, you know, fiberglass bat insulation that has this uh, plastic vinyl stuff. And so it's, it's just hanging from the ceiling, but it wasn't properly sealed. And it was just this big fracas where the landlord didn't set a claim that he never knew that they were making wine in there, but of course they were. And so anyway, all this moist air climbed up and got into this um, batten insulation, and it got really wet, and you know basically it hammocked. And so then finally the vinyl gave way, and just all this rotten water came down. And so I had to like inspect it, and it, it was just like it smelled like the nastiest men's locker room you've ever been in. <laughs> and um, I will uh, let's just say that it's a wine that you know very well. <laughs> yeah. Two shot? No, no, it's. <laughs> No, I, you know, I'm not going to say it. I'm, I'm going to take the high road. Thank you.
Hey, thank you all so much for the great questions. Matt is actually going to stick around up here at the front of the stage. If you have more questions, want to talk to him, please come on up. We're going to take another short intermission, and then we'll get back to our third presenter, which I guarantee you will love. See you soon.